Well, it's 2023, which means it's uh, we've been apart from hieroglyphics long enough over the centuries that it's about time that we started actually studying them, and uh, that's why we have this series. Okay, my jokes are terrible this week. Let's just jump right into doodling with purpose. All right, so we start off with our homework from last week, which as always is a good time to practice glyphing, and uh, obviously if you have any questions about them, because there are some determinatives and some modifications of glyphs in this, I can always answer that in the comments. And once we've transliterated it, well, actually, now that we've hieroglyphed we've glyphed it, we can transliterate it. So we'll start with all the sounds and the sound complements. So those are all the dashes and the happy faces and the dots that tell us what version of what letter to say. And now we can start translating it. And the first word, netter hum, or hum netter, as it would be pronounced, priest, because it's honorific transposition. It's one of those uh, glyphs that always gets transposed, the netter flag glyph or about the symbol of royalty, really. All right, good is our next word, and then loves. So we have the good priest, or a good priest loves. What does the good priest love? Noting uh, we've got two proper nouns coming up. Well, we have God, which is the symbol of divineness, which I call a flag, <laughs> next to a god. You'll notice he's holding an onk in his hand, just like is the word for goddess, except now we've added uh, two Ts and an R to differentiate between god and goddess, because all feminine end in a T. All right, the god and the goddess are I-N, which is by, so they're by something. And what are they by? They're by a carob tree, because that was in our vocabulary, because that's how these things work. Isn't it neat how the vocabulary just seems to show up in these sentences I'm making up? This does take a lot of work, you know. All right, and what kind of carob tree? A sweet carob tree, again, making sure we hit lots of that vocabulary, as well as uh, not do doing too deep on structure. Of course, we have to add our uh, articles, thes, ands, etc. So it becomes the good priest loves the god and the goddess by the sweet carob tree. Hey, why not? It's uh, a lot more plausible than the one last week where I had someone turning into a cat. All right, let's look at three new trilateral glyphs. We're almost out of trilateral glyphs. We're at the R's. So this would be Ruwaj, Ruwaj, the D there in the J form, and it's done pretty easily. It's a rope coil, so you'll start at the top and come around in a circle. So here we have a word that says Rajud, and with an extra T, well, Ruwud, and then a T at the end, and then that's a determinative, and it's a determinative of a piece of sandstone, and shockingly, it's the word sandstone. Yes, I know it could look like the SH sound, but usually that has two dashes in it, indicating it's a fool. All right, and here another word with our rope coil. So we have rewood followed by a W. Now when a W is the last letter, it usually is indicating a plural of some type. And then of course we have a determinative, which we know is a determinative because it's not a letter. In this case, a hand holding a sword. So this is the verb to control or to administer. And you do that to many. So hence why it's on a plural there. All right, let's move forward. Now here's an interesting word because here the letters spell out redud and then are followed by redud. So, it, well, actually noting that the D for the hand is the hard D, but the D in ruj is the soft D that's more like a J. I should have put a, a dash there to indicate, there we go, there's my dash. All right, so it's not quite an echo effect, but it serves to be one. Um, I suppose they could have spelled it with the with the F, the, the, the viper going down instead of the hand. But hey, leave it to the Egyptians. They knew what they were doing. It's probably because it physically looked better to have it in a block like that. All right, next up we have uh, Zaba, Zaba. So S with the dash like soap, Zaba, soap, Zaba. And then the A, like the uh, vulture, the cockney bottle. So here we have uh, Saba, another A, ah, and then Y, T, and the determinative of a papyrus scroll, which we actually just even looked at a, a word or two ago, remembering that it's the determinative for something that can't really be expressed visually in any other way. All right, so we have an echo effect there with the uh, Saba and an extra A. Ah stretching it out for graphical enjoyment, for lack of a better word. And so we'll get rid of that extra A, which leaves us with sabait, sabait. And 
this is going to translate into the English word, the written teaching. So it's kind of like a religious saying, like, you know, knowing the Bible, knowing the Quran, knowing the, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, but not quite as, as direct as that. All right, moving on to Saba with Ruud at the end and followed by Ra, the sun. Now, these are both actually determinatives. Yes, again, we know that uh, the star can be Saba, but in this case, we are spelling out the word Saba. And it works as both a reflection and a determinative because we're dealing with a star. This is what it is. You are drawing a star, and this is the word for star. So, yes, you could just have the glyph, but if it was spelled out in full, that's how they would do it, again, because it makes a nice perfect little block. Look at how that rectangle looks. It's so beautiful. And when the glyphs can be spelled out like a rectangle or a square, the Egyptians are very happy. They like those, those shapes. All right. Now here we have S with no mark, I-A, and S with no mark is like the Z in rose. So it's the S that's really a Z. So what you're saying really is Zia, not Sia. And I tend to actually write it that way. Uh, it's probably cheating. You should write the S with no sign. So that would make this Zia, ah, and at the end we see a heart, which we remember could be pronounced ib, but it is a determinative. It's not a letter. If it's by itself, it could be pronounced ib, but in this case, it's a determinative for the word. So we have zia, ah, and of course, there's an easy echo effect to get rid of there. This comes out to the word wise. Why is a heart a determinative for wise? Well, it's actually because of the fact that the heart symbolizes all of, of your knowledge of your soul, and it's weighed against a feather in the afterlife. You could see a heart on the left and the feather on the right. All right, so that gets into more Egyptian religious aspects. We're going to stick to the language for now. So here we have another word, za'a, with a determinative of a man pointing to his face, meaning it's something spoken or relating possibly to even food, but the mouth is involved. And in this case, it's to recognize, to know, because you would that's how you would speak. You'd say, I recognize you. I know you. There's no, there's no way to draw that. Well, I guess you could use a papyrus scroll. All right. So here's your homework for next week. And let's jump in and glyph this. Always practice glyphing first and foremost. Find your words. Transliterate it. Translate it. And if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments and I'll try to jump right in and help out. Thank you again so much for watching. It's always a pleasure to have you here at Doodling with Purpose as we go year after year keeping ancient knowledge alive and having fun while we do it. If you liked it, like it and share it. It's the best way to show support for this channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.